Taxes pass in his own P51 there, but coming in again from your right-hand side, here comes our lovely formation, led by Cam in that P47. See the vortices coming off the wingtips of that F35. which is the conventional takeoff and landing. The F-35B is the uh, vertical landing short takeoff version, which is what the, the UK military operates. out in this, the 80th anniversary of D-Day, what a non-negotiable aspect of Operation Overlord um, was the reduction of the Luftwaffe over a large swathe of Northwest Europe before D-Day could be launched. The and the reason decade, for that, there are going to be over 600 planes. Take off and do their stuff. States Army Air Corps and then Army Air Force throughout the Second World War. B-29 came in at the, towards the end of the war, but B-17 produced all the way and of course was the mainstay of the mighty 8th Air Force as well as the 15th Air Force in Italy. Just a phenomenal, a phenomenal aircraft. Again, could take huge amounts of punishment. But also, okay. does anyone who's seen Masters... And I have to say, I thought it really, really held up. Uh, I think it's a terrific film. It's a brilliant, amazing film. Did the Bombay doors open on Sally B there, just as uh, just giving us a, a belly side pass. Now, it always amazes me just how small the bomb bay yeah. and those doors are on a beast. Most night fighters, Luftwaffe night fighters are attacking from underneath with their Schrager music, their uh, cannons pointed upwards, so very, very underprotected. Um, but the underprotection means they can take more bomb load, so it's a payoff. But, you know, that's why nearly 50% of all those who flew in Bomber Command didn't make it home. It's always a payoff. I remember talking to a crew member, that, I think he was the um, he was either the navigator or the bombardier, I can't remember, um, on a B-17 that was, that was initially earmarked for the 8th Air Force, came over in 1942. 
place for a feast for the beautiful quarters of the fuselage just in front of the tailplane. Yeah, that's more than enough for a couple of bichons. And they still made it home, Lee. That's the amazing thing, Lee. So, uh, three ship of P-51s flying past as we now see these two bouchons rolling down runway 21. about what the Messerschmitt looked like, what it could do in the air. Japanese as the war progresses. And I suppose one of the kind of one of the shifts going the moment. We do know, ladies and gentlemen, that Danielle on the top there giving us a wave can see you waving, so please give her a big, big wave as Emiliano pulls very tight. That can't be easy for Danielle. Her leg is straight out in front of her now. She's pulling at least 4G in this aerobatic routine. vertical manoeuvres, here they come again, Daniel waving. which I think is absolutely incredible. Very, very steep dive. She's now laying across the, the wires holding the wings there, ladies and gentlemen, pulling up into a loop as Danielle is laying between the wings with her arm outstretched. Oh, 
she's oh, definitely gone even further out on the wing by the looks of it. Everybody, slow speed pass, let's give her a huge wave. Gentlemen, get your cameras out. Danielle is hanging upside down from that lower wing with her arms outstretched. <laughs> that cannot be comfortable. Impressive stomach muscles as well. Climbing back up now. Oh, we're going to see a landing here. You, can, you, you might think you know a lot about the Second World War, but you don't know everything. Here we go, Emilio and I bring it down for a lovely soft landing, I hope, on runway two, two, three. A big wave to Emiliano and Daniel. Please put your hands together for 46 Aviation, Daniel and Emiliano. That was absolutely fantastic. One of the things that um, fighter pilots often talk about their battles in the Second World War is how they're in the middle of a melee one minute and the next minute the skies are completely empty. And um, we've been fortunate enough. OK. <laughs> oh, OK. Well, we were expecting that, but why not? They say it's all about communication, James, and uh, we clearly don't have any communication with the control tower because uh, this aircraft was actually due in... Um, oh, in fact, that's a little bit early. Yeah, that's how bad. We've actually been talking about those guys, but they're holding over this, so that's a little slip up on our part. Oh, I like that's that. Fine, uh, Lingy. We're, we're, we're swift to respond <laughs> in any situation that's flung our way. So I apologise for that, ladies and gentlemen. We do have uh, the 727 front end. They take off and they intercept a big formation of B-17s and he thinks, or maybe it's Liberators, but it's American heavy bombers. And he sees that his wingman actually shoots the plane down. He goes, oh, I should be good on it. Maybe this guy's got some else. And um, no sooner does he see the, the, the bomber going down, then he sort of says, this is wingman going down. And he follows him down, seeing this plane, no parachute coming out. Spar from the back of the formation to put on his solo performance. With uh, sea gladiators and uh, full Mars, none of which could really match the, um, the machines it was pitted against. A very manoeuvrable, isn't it? Uh, very, very manoeuvrable. And, and like the rest of the Grummers and the Hellcat, uh, which uh, was the sort of the, the machine which sat in between the Wildcat and the, the Bearcat, uh, was responsible for more uh, American kills than any other aeroplane in US service uh, out over the Pacific against the Japanese. So the, this um, family of Grumman naval fighters uh, was hugely, hugely successful. Rugged and, uh, and I mean, Grumman went on, uh, you know, after the Second World War to go and build um, the Tomcat of, uh, of Top Gun fame. So really close association with naval aviation for decades. Grumman are obviously wearing the, um, the white and black uh, D-Day stripes, so although uh, it was um, uh, quickly superseded by Corsairs uh, from the left. Originally, a 
let's just listen to them. That's good. Um, sounds good. Uh, and it's just amazing to see. And I really go with that, that rule of thumb that if it looks good, it probably is good. I mean, it doesn't always work out, but for the most part it does. Nine times out of ten. Mustangs um, in skies over Central America in war between uh, Honduras and, and El Salvador. So the last Corsair kill, the, I think the last Mustang kill too, were, uh, took place in 1969. Well, what? Is that's just a classic fight, a sight, isn't it? There's three fighters coming out of the sun. is that when you're trying to suddenly increase production dramatically, a lot of the machine tools and the know-how, it is also easier to quickly produce in numbers. And they more than performed a job in 1940, and frankly, the country owes a debt to the hurricane. Out of all proportion to it's a with eight Browning 0.303 machine guns. And they could store enough ammunition to fire for 14.7 seconds continually, which I'm sure will agree is not very much. Red out, whereas the measurement one only.
So the power's gone on. Up comes the tail and straight away airborne. Ease a second. That's what she was just demonstrating. Here we go again. So rolling towards us. into a flat spin now so you can see the aircraft is purely flat as she spins back towards the earth recovers from that 90 degrees nose down pitching hard as she pulls out back onto the display line into a four point roll how many gears is she pulling at that point oh uh, probably at the recovery of that vertical dive maybe around about 6g the aircraft is actually stressed to plus 10g little ruard at the top there little tumble onto the 45 down Upside down now. I talked about the new version. It's called the Gen G, the next generation or new generation. So coming down the line now, slow roll. So using her hands and feet to coordinate the controls into fast roll to finish into slow roll. Slow roll because of the the way the aircraft wants to drop as you roll slowly. You have to use your feet coordinated with your hands as the aircraft rolls. You use the rudder to keep the fuselage in the position you want it to keep the aircraft level. So a lot of coordination during a slow roll using hands and feet. It's going to come in for a knife edge. Now this is a good time for cameras and get your arms ready, boys and girls. Using the entire rudder there, that massive rudder on the trailing edge of the tail. In from your left hand side. So, what this aircraft looks like. seeing this for the first time and you think you know just in a matter of a few short years we've gone from a bi biplane, um, biplane era to a monoplane one think how futuristic and modern that must have seemed to a civilian on the ground looking up at that in 1936 when this first flew it's easy to take these things for granted isn't it and and to see them for what they are today but the sense of the pioneering spirit that is going into aviation in the 1930s, I think, is just amazing. And then, of course, into the second half of the 1940s, really, you've got the emergence of the jet age as well. When you think of the design of something like the Vulcan, which is first, first sketches drawn up. I think the first sketch was in 1946, seven, something ten, like that. Ten years between the first flight of the Lancaster and the first flight of the Vulcan. It was yeah, some crazy like development. Oh, we can see now that uh, the aircraft is configured. The undercarriage is down. It's very slow on the way in, isn't it? Big flaps you can see as well. all these designers are playing with designs such as the twin rudder and twin booms that we're going to see later on on the p38 lightning for example what can be done what how can you push the envelope in aviation design what could be achieved how can we get them faster more maneuverable all this is being flung into the mix and then heightened further by the onset the of the second world war the one is in the propeller and he can change the pitch of it he's checking the here we go, he's gone to full power ready for his takeoff. Some of you might notice about this aircraft compared to Melanie's four bladed propeller instead of three, which will make it slightly quieter. Smoke on. 
Very light aeroplane, lots of power, straight up into a half loop. What do you want me to talk about? He said, well, this is a one-off. So I'm not going to display this aeroplane except here at Cywell. So you're getting a, a very unique treat this afternoon. Control surfaces, the aileron rudder and elevator, or that tumble there, out to our right. The elevator's rudder and elevator, or ailerons, all within the prop disc. In fact, the, the, elevator, the ailerons on a game bird are far bigger than those of an extra, so even more role authority. Uh, the eagle-eyed among you may see both on Melanie's extra and on this game bird that there's a almost coat hanger-esque uh, Protrusion on each wingtip, that is a, an aerobatic sight. So if you could see it as, you, as it goes past, it has a vertical line, a 45 degree line, and a 45 degree down line. And that's for the pilot, it's in line with the pilot's head, and it's him to, or her to use as they fly aerobatics to have reference to the horizon. It's almost like a protractor, if you like. The pilot looks at that protractor and puts the aircraft exactly at the angle they want to perform these maneuvers. to the vertical from Steve. And a push over. Steve Jones in his Game Bird GB1.
270 to 280 miles an hour if we really needed to, kind of cruising speed of 230, which is pretty nimble. Very versatile. I was talking earlier on about the need to destroy bridges and marshalling yards. Yeah, I mean, look at it. You can see how kind of manoeuvrable it is. I mean, it's really much more... It's a bomber, for goodness sake. Delicately, isn't it? You know, I see that and I just think of these planes flying. But their speed and their agility certainly counted. You know, obviously it's much harder for anti-aircraft guns to hit something that's moving fast. And they were incredibly successful. Another major operation was... Major attack, Operation Dyer. Just the wrong time there, certainly for all you photographers trying to get that second Infantry. formation loop. The DC-6, the B-25, the Lightning, the Mustang and the Corsair, so rather envious of his job. the P-51 is Eskil Amdahl. Uh, Eskil is a Norwegian, a former Norwegian Air Force test pilot and latterly Airbus test pilot. So he has flown the F-35 Lightning, the F-16, the F-104 Starfighter, the Sea Fury, the Eurofighter Typhoon and even the Mi- yeah, here, the the cameras ready. here they come now, I'm going to shut up and just watch this. Absolutely beautiful. And during COVID, we uh, we did a something called the armchair. The flight line as they go to full power. Who needs a long runway when you've got a triplane or a vintage biplane? I wasn't expecting that. The to admit. is still a kind of known procedure, and and of course that was from the German first of all fighter race in moment. displays I think I've ever seen. It's not even going outside the, the lateral edges of the, the flight line in front of us. So you're right, that performance, I know they are much slower speed, but even so, they, just watching this triplane to our left, just how tight he turns around that corner. Yeah, it's amazing, it's isn't amazing. it? You really do get a sense of a totally different type of air combat with these machines, don't you? And it's interesting, I remember talking to Tom Neal, Back of Britain fighter pilot, one of the first Allied pilots to land in Normandy on D plus one. Incredible career. He's flying Hurricanes with 249 Squadron in the Battle of Britain. I remember him telling me that the ME 109E could do the three things you needed to do in air combat in 1940. It could climb very fast, it could die very fast. 
just giving us a slow speed pass out. I think the, the engine is just using the throttle, making sure the engine doesn't stop just by pumping the throttle there, is what it sounded like, before he climbs away. Over to our right, though. Reconnaissance. So Took over from Mitchell when he sadly passed away. Um, Beverly Shenstone and Al Faddy. And it was Shenstone, Smith and Faddy who were really responsible for the elliptical wing rather than Mitchell. side at the front seven Merlin power spitfires get ready people and I'm gonna keep quiet now I think So less G, so he's catering for the wind there. What he doesn't want is the wind blowing the formation towards the crowd and coming closer than he's allowed as dictated by the rules of, from the Civil Aviation Authority. So letting it out a bit, as he said, around the back, just means he can fly the formation without getting affected by the wind and blowing over the crowd line. And now tightening, that's the opposite. He's pulling back on the stick just to pull a little bit more G and tighten the turn complete this fly past. tail chase now they're going to split the formation complex in itself to try and get nine aircraft now into a tail chase so that's what they're doing over to our front left I talked about tail chasing and the intricacies of using lead and lag geometry to keep in the formation but Paul now going to lead a nine ship tail chase Photoshopped pictures where you see one aircraft and time stills of the photos, but it is real, ladies and gentlemen.
It's such a lovely looking plane, isn't it? For a biplane, it's, you think? It, I love flying them. I'm very lucky. I, the uh, Ian Castle here at Saiwa, he allows me to fly his Tiger Moths from time to time, and it's such a different way of flying. That open cockpit, as I mentioned, is really light, very responsive controls. It's, it's slow, it, but it's nimble in the sa at the same time. So, as you can see with Danny here, as he comes around in a turn train, the underside of the aircraft. Special to me, my late grandfather, who was a Lancaster pilot, did his first solo in a Tiger Moth, and I've got it in his logbook, which, uh, so it's very, very special when I first got my hands on one of these and, and got to fly it. But the, the reason why we've put this in the show this evening, ladies and gentlemen, is to talk about a very special scholarship indeed, and a very special foundation. So unfortunately, back in 2019, a chap called Thomas Castle, who was the son of Ian Castle I just mentioned, he was tragically killed in an aerobatic accident. So. Tom was very keen on the Tiger Moth. In fact, the black, red, and silver version you can see out on the flight line there, Gianti, was no, is now known as Tom's Tiger. He looked after that aircraft so magnificently. When Tom was sadly killed in 2019, Ian set up the Thomas Castle Aviation Heritage Scholarship, which enables budding display pilots or budding pilots to learn about vintage aviation. They can come and get the scholarship five hours to learn how to fly tailwheel aircraft, vintage open cockpit biplanes, but also get really involved with the engineering side of what it keeps or takes to keep these aircraft in the air. So a very special scholarship indeed. And that is what Danny is showing today to generate support for that amazing foundation. Well, good for him. And there used to be that one place left in the UK where you could fly tail draggers like this and learn to fly on a Tiger Moth, and that was at Marshalls at Cambridge. Is that still the case, do you know? I think you can fly absolutely here in these now. There's lots of examples.